All right, this is the Sunday morning message. Uh, I don't know that this is going to be the <laughs> end of the message. It may continue because just like our Sunday school lesson, uh, it is a subject that you have to pretty much run through the entirety of the scriptures with. And what we're going to be speaking to this morning is a heresy that I've been aware of since I was saved. And, of course, when I was a baby Christian, uh, only saved for a short period of time was the first time I heard this, and I didn't know any better. I didn't have any knowledge yet. Uh, fortunately, it didn't take me too long to find out that this is wrong. And so that's what we're going to be speaking to this morning. And so, Heavenly Father, again, I pray and ask for the guidance and help of your precious and dwelling Holy Spirit to guide me as I speak to this truth, Father. Uh, it's very prevalent in the churches. And it is incredibly important, Lord, that it be addressed. And so I pray, Father, that you will help me in doing so. And I pray and ask for it in Christ's name. Amen. Now, this heresy is one that continues to deceive Christians. And quite frankly, it's been repeatedly addressed uh, for the last 2,000 years. But yet it continues to crop up. Uh, and that is the lie that everyone from Adam right down to today gets saved the same exact way as we do in the church age. Salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. First time I heard this was in the very first church that I belonged to. Uh, in fact, I believe it was an evangelist who was visiting at the time who made this statement. And knowing this man, I have a feeling that he made that statement because it's what he had probably heard all his life. And the danger that can happen, and you all know that I've warned you of this as our previous pastor has warned you of it as well is don't believe me <laughs> read the scriptures know the Word of God any human being is capable of error and it's important that we know what God has said now, nothing can be farther from the truth. <laughs> okay, we have not all been saved. We have not all been given righteousness in the eyes of God exactly the same way from Adam till today as a person receives salvation during the church age. It just simply is not true. So why does it persist? Why does it persist? Well, like I just said, it's because people are not serious students of the Word of God. They take for granted things that are said by pastors, by educators, and they just assume they are correct. And you can't do that. I'm not saying all no, that you question and challenge absolutely everything, but if you were a serious student of the Word of God, it's not going to take long before you come to the point in reading the Scriptures that if this was what you had been taught, that you're going to find it in conflict with what the Word of God has to say. 
And so now you're going to have to see there's, okay, how do I deal with this? Do I just ignore it and go on believing and repeating what I've been told? Do I try somehow to twist scripture? To make it match what I've been told so that I don't challenge these good godly men that have passed down these truths from blah 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 or are you going to say well upon doing my due diligence the word of God says this so irrespective of what doctor so and so or pastor so and so has said okay the Word of God says this, and that is where I am going to stand. Uh, I mean, and that's where it has to be. See, part of the problem, see, is people forget the fact we have an enemy who is very subtle and very clever and very deceptive and he will always use ways to undermine truth and undermine faith by using things that in man's wisdom sounds right and sounds good. That he counts on biblical ignorance. He counts on you being ignorant of the Word of God. Personally ignorant. I don't care how many years you've been saved, how faithful you have been to the gathering of the church, and then, in, you know, I've been to every Sunday school and every Sunday morning service and Sunday evening service, and I'm there for prayer and, 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 and teaching on, on the midweek service. Okay, if you are not a personal student of the Word of God, all you're doing is believing what you've been told and parroting that stuff up. You know, so, <laughs> therein lies the problem. Now, you don't want to give the enemy a weapon to use against you. And your ignorance of the Word of God is a weapon he will take advantage of. So we need to look at each separate dispensation of revealed knowledge that God has given through the ages to men. For men to respond to in order to be deemed righteous in the eyes of God. Now again, we covered some of this in this morning's Sunday School lesson. But we have the Edenic Covenant, man and his innocence in the Garden of Eden, uh, where... Uh, what was dispensed to him was one simple truth. Thou shalt not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Strict obedience. There is no faith required here. God walked with man. Man could see the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All that was required of him was to obey believe what God said and obey him and of course we know Adam failed in that trial and all of humanity fell under the curse of sin which then led to the Adamic covenant which is a covenant of individual conscience okay it was faith and works you exercise faith in what I have told you is so and that I will do what I have said and then you follow through with that with the works that I have given you to do, which in this case was the blood sacrifice. Adam and Eve first experienced that when God killed 
two lambs to take their skins to make coats as coverings for their sin. And we see that they have taught this too and it being carried out by their, their sons, Cain and Abel. There, as we read about in Genesis chapter 4, there as they are at the entrance to the Garden of Eden and they are offering their sacrifices. Abel offers what was required. Cain does not. Abel is just before God. Cain is not. This lasts until the Mosaic Covenant, the law. Now the law essentially is in two parts. You have the Ten Commandments of God, and those are applicable to every human being, Jew or Gentile. But then we have those laws that are given specifically to the nation of Israel to fulfill. We have those in Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers. They're all through those. We have these Levitical laws, if you will, that are required of the nation of Israel to keep. We then have salvation by grace through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel of salvation for this current age in which we are in, which is from the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ until the rapture when the church is taken out. During the tribulation period, it reverts back to faith and works because the church has been taken out. God returns to dealing with Israel in specific, though all men are offered salvation. Again, it's faith and works. Faith is being exercised in the fully revealed truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and then the works for the Gentile people the Ten Commandments for the Jew it's keeping everything that is listed in the Levitical laws as much as they are able to because once the temple is rebuilt they aren't going to have access to it and that's a whole other subject to get into about uh, the Antichrist usurping uh, that and declaring himself to be God and seeing himself in the Holy of Holies and so on. Uh, Christ made it plain though that if you worship the Lord God as the one and only true God and you love your neighbor as yourself, this is all the law and the prophets and that's what's required. In the millennial reign we're back to simple obedience just as we were in the garden prior to the fall. Why? because we have the Lord Jesus Christ fully revealed, literally, physically, ruling and reigning here upon the earth. All that's required is your obedience to be found righteous in the eyes of God. And then when we go out into eternity, we have humanity has been perfected and is sinless. There, there, there is no, no work to be done. Christ has completed the work. No faith required. God is dwelling with man. So we're going to cover each one and provide via the scriptures, just as we should, uh, that righteousness in the eyes of God is not received the same way throughout the 7,000 years years, what will be 7,000 years of human history. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15, 16, and 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. There it is. No faith required. God says, 
this is the one thing I require of you right here. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can eat from every other tree freely, including the tree of life. But you eat from this tree, and the day that you eat of it, thou shalt surely die. And he did. He died spiritually. He ceased to be a living soul. His mortal body changed in that it ceased to have a water circulatory system. And it ended up having blood. Where did he get the blood from? From the fruit that he ate. It was the blood of the grape. And man ceased to be a living soul. The man became a dead soul. Life and death are conditions of existence. Now, from here, let's go to Genesis 3 6. Okay, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Okay, she could see it. It's good for food. And that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And of course, man falls God asks him what have you done he tries to blame Eve there in verse 12 the man said the woman whom thou gavest to be with me she gave me the fruit and I did eat and of course she says well the serpent beguiled me uh, into doing this verse 17 and unto Adam he said because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee saying Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And that's how it is for him. Verse 24, and so he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned everywhere to keep the way of the tree of life so that Adam couldn't take of the tree of life and live or exist, more correctly put, forever as a dead soul. Would have sealed his fate. So God in love and compassion and mercy drove him out of the garden to keep that way. But the curse stayed. Genesis chapter 5, verse 5, 5 being the number of death, so we've got the 5th chapter, the 5th verse of the 5th chapter, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. He died spiritually immediately. His mortal body then died, and his righteous soul had to go and reside in a place that God set aside specifically for the righteous souls in the center of the earth, which was paradise, where he would wait for the coming of the promised seed who would bruise the serpent's head, the seed of a woman. And he was there until Christ led captivity captive at his resurrection. <coughs> Now, when we come to this time frame of the Adamic Covenant, uh, the time of conscience, okay, it's faith and works of the individual believer. You know, Adam never, not once, was told anything about the cross or the church. He didn't know a thing about it. No evidence whatsoever throughout the scriptures that Adam had any awareness of who that seed would be and what it was that they would accomplish beyond the fact that they would destroy man's enemy, the devil. 
What he's told is in Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, he's speaking to Satan, and between thy seed and her seed, it will bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I mean, from this we learn the following, okay? There's enmity between Satan and the woman. Okay, now we're talking women, womankind in general. Uh, we also learn later in the final book of the Bible, uh, chapter 12 of the book of the Revelation, that the woman who would bring forth the seed of woman is referred to as the nation of Israel. And the Bible says he goes and he persecutes that woman. And boy, has he. Okay. We learn that that enmity exists between Satan's seed. Satan has a seed. Okay. Satan has a seed. Okay. The Bible says it. You better believe it. Okay. And the woman's seed. Now, women don't carry the seed. Man carries the seed. Okay. Now, we know from having perfect revelation that what we're being told here is the virgin birth. They didn't know that. That wasn't revealed as of yet. That hadn't been dispensed to them as of yet. They know that the woman's seed will bruise the head of Satan's seed, but he will bruise the heel of the woman's seed. This all sounds very cryptic, but that's because they didn't have a, the complete and full revelation <coughs> that we have now. And this has got to be remembered. Back when Eve gives birth to Cain, who is Satan's seed, she believes he's the promised seed. You know, Genesis 4.1, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. She thought this was who it was. And of course, she couldn't have been more wrong. This time of individual conscience here the time frame that begins with the fall and runs through to the giving of the law you know Genesis 3 God kills two lambs sheds their blood makes coats of skin to cover the bodies of Adam and Eve who now realize that they are naked and the shedding of this blood is a temporary covering until the promised seed comes who will destroy Satan and his hold over mankind. How do we know it's temporary? Because they have to keep repeating it over and over and over and over again. It's not done. It's a type. Okay, Hebrews tells us the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. The shedding of you know, uh, blood has got to be the blood of the one who has sinned. Okay, it's a temporary remittance for sin. Okay, and Adam and Eve were instructed to offer up a like sacrifice on a regular basis. How often, I don't know. Maybe it was yearly or as they felt the need to do so. And again, it's what we find they have taught Cain and Abel when we read in Genesis chapter 4. And when we continue to read through Genesis, we find Noah doing the same thing. We find Job doing the same thing. We find Abraham doing the same thing. We see Isaac and Jacob doing the same thing. They're all examples of those who obeyed by their conscience revelation that had been dispensed to them by God and were obeying what they had been commanded to do. They believed what God has said. They trusted God to do what God had said he would do if they did the works they were commanded to work. Faith and works. 
okay, based on the revelations given by God. In fact, go to Job chapter 19. Book of Job, chapter 19, and let's look at verses 25, 26, and 27. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Within me. Okay, Job knows that he needs a redeemer. He knows that the Lord is that Redeemer. He knows that he will stand literally and physically on the earth in the latter day, the last days. And he knows that even though the mortal flesh that he currently has should go to the grave, and be worm eaten. He said, I will see him. I will stand there in his presence in my flesh. A regenerated body. What kind of body was he expecting to get? One like Adam had before the fall. A perfect body in that it was flesh and bone and had a water circulatory system. He would have access to the tree of life. He would have the Spirit of God renewed in him. He would be a living soul. That's what he knew. That's what had been revealed to him. Now you notice there's still no mention of God becoming a man. We have no mention of God becoming sin for us. We have no mention of God dying for those sins on our behalf on a cross and suffering in hell for us and then being resurrected and being given an immortal body. We have none of that. He knows nothing about that. That would be completely foreign to his knowledge, his way of being just with God that he knew what God had given to him was to trust and believe what, what God has revealed to him and to offer that sacrifice, uh, that temporary blood covering as often as God uh, brought it to his conscience to do so. Then we come to the Mosaic Law. Go to Leviticus 8.5. Leviticus chapter 8, verse 5. And Moses said unto the congregation, This is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. Okay. Well, that's going to be 18.5. I mean, that worked, but no, I wanted 18.5. My apologies. There's got to be at least one in every message, folks. <laughs> That's gotten to be a norm with me, huh? 18.5 Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. It's a do or die thing, the law. Yeah, you're going to believe what God said. Have trust and faith in what God said, that if I don't do what you've said to do, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to hell. Okay. Romans chapter 2, verse 13. Romans 2, 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. You want to be justified before God via law? You have to do the law. Good luck to you. It ain't going to happen. Only one man 
has ever kept the law without fail. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. Then it was effective for him because like first Adam, last Adam was born without guilt. He was innocent because he didn't inherit Adam's sin debt. He is the only begotten Son of God. And so his keeping of the law was sufficient. See, a man who is lost and under the curse of sin, it doesn't matter if he keeps every point of the law. What's required is his blood. That's all there is to it. It's his blood that's required. <laughs> and you can't get around that. There is no getting around that truth. It is faith and works under the law of the individual believer, but it is also faith and works for the nation of Israel. Now, scriptures are very clear on the subject about faith and works. Under the law, you are justified by your works. Your faith is required, but it's worthless without your works. Uh, and... It's the same case with Israel as a nation, and we're going to come to that. You know, but you say, well, what about all the prophecies of the Messiah all throughout the Bible? Well, yeah, they had the law and the prophets. They had, you know, if we think about the the Old Testament Jew, uh, you know, from Malachi onward, so he's got the completed Old Testament revelation. Why didn't he know? Why didn't they accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah and their Savior? They must have known. They must have been looking for... No, they had no idea. And the Scripture tells us that plainly. Again, Exodus 34. Nothing like the Bible to clear up some ignorance. Exodus 34, verses 30 to 35. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh to him, or to come nigh him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off, until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, and Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him, being the Lord. New Testament, Romans eleven twenty five. Romans 11, verse 25. Then we're going to go to 2 Corinthians. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Okay, so they are blinded, ignorant, of something. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 12 through 15. 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel should not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, 
for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, the Jew first and to the Gentile, to the Greek. But there's been a veil, a blindness that God has deliberately put there. Uh, in fact, go back into 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's see here. 1 Corinthians 2, uh, and let's see, verses 6, 7, and 8. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, as far as I know, the princes of this world are led by one prince of this world, the God of this world, who was Satan. And had they known that, Oh no, they never would have crucified because they wouldn't have wanted him to have that victory. They're blind to it. They're blind to it. They had all the law, they had all the prophets, but they did not have the full and perfect revelation. It had not yet been dispensed to them. Now, during the church age, from the resurrection of Jesus Christ until the rapture, salvation is obtained by faith alone. Christ has done the work. It's the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are exercising our faith in. There's nothing for us to do, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he has saved us, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Okay, no work for us to do. Paul, in the three years that he spent in the Arabian desert alone with the Lord Jesus Christ, received the revelations, received the mysteries that opened up the Old Testament to him and opened up the truth of the Old Testament about the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we can see those truths in the Old Testament. But they couldn't in the Old Testament. We can see Christ all the way throughout the Old Testament because we have the full and complete revelation. Okay? They had zero revelation of God becoming a man. They had zero revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ taking the sins of man upon himself, of going to the cross at Calvary, of suffering and dying and experiencing hell on our behalf and then being raised again from the dead, incorruptible in an eternal body and that whosoever would exercise their faith in his finished work would be saved. They had no grasp of it, no understanding of it. Every Old Testament saint was waiting in paradise for the coming of the Redeemer, the coming of the Messiah. And it wasn't until Christ went and preached to the souls there in the center of the earth that they were given the truth to those who were in paradise waiting a great joy of revelation to those souls that were in hell horror of eternal condemnation and no escape now in the tribulation after the church is taken out god returns to dealing with the jew during this seven year period first three and a half years the period of false peace in which the Antichrist comes to power. The temple is rebuilt. The Jews think that, you know, hey, the kingdom has come. Many of them even believe that he is indeed 
of the Christ. That's why he is called the Antichrist. But when they are ready to dedicate the temple, the Antichrist goes in, seats himself in the Holy of Holies, declares himself to be God. The devil enters into him and possesses him, and he becomes the beast in the last three and a half years of that tribulation period are known as Jacob's trouble. When Satan, through the beast and the false prophet, persecute the woman, the nation of Israel, and all who have exercised faith in Jesus Christ and who are striving to live according to the law, the revelation that's been given to them, uh, he tries to find them and to kill them. Now the faith they're exercising is in the fully revealed Jesus Christ. You have first have the 144,000 Jewish pro uh, prophets, young men who are not married, have never known a woman, who turn to Christ after they read the revelation of, in the scriptures and they believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and they begin to preach. The halfway point you are going to have Moses and Elijah are going to be sent back to the earth and the law and the prophets to be a witness and a test. But salvation still requires their works. Their works. Well, why? Why does that? Why, if they have that, why do they have to work? Why is it not sufficient for them? The body's been taken out. The marriage supper of the Lamb has taken place.